Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. So today we are continuing with verse 254 and verse 255, which read as follows. Akase wa padang nati Samano nati bahire Papancha birata paja Nipa pancha tathagata Akase wa padang nati Samano nati bahire Sankara sasatta nati Nati Buddha Naminjitang, which mean there is no path in the sky, there is no samana outside, people delight in papancha. But the Buddhas are free from papancha, nipapancha. There is no path in the sky, there is no samana outside. There is no formation, no sankhara that is eternal. And there is no shaking or vas no no wavering. Of a Buddha, of the Buddhas. So these verses are supposed to have been a part of the teaching that the Buddha gave to Subhadha. So it's maybe the first story where the story doesn't have anything to do with the actual content of the verses. Uh, the story goes that well, Subhadha is a special case. Uh, he was in a past life. He was a brother with uh, another of the Buddha's disciples, Kundanya. So, when the Buddha first decided who to teach, he thought of the five ascetics who had cared for him and, and followed him and and uh, depended on him for their teachings, but who had abandoned him. And he went to find them, and Kundanya was the eldest of them. And when the Buddha first taught them, Kundanya was immediately uh, it attained sotapanna. So he, he immediately understood the Buddha's teaching and attained the first stage of enlightenment. He was the first. And that's apparently because he had this sort of uh, what we call upanisaya. He had this basis for it from past lives so his his character type was the sort to do things first and there's a story where he was brothers with the, the person who would the being who would eventually become Subhadda and together they grew rice and they were also followers of some Buddha or maybe they were uh, they were religious people, so they were into giving alms to religious mendicants. And as soon as the rice uh, sprouted and uh, bore fruit, green fruit, it's called young rice, you know, uh, Kondanya, the, the man who was to become Kondanya, said to his brother, you know, I, I want to. I want to give. The, I think we should give the first part of our crop. He was in a hurry, and give give to religious people because you can eat the young rice. I guess you can make milk out of it or something. But so the the other his brother was, uh, said shook his head and said, "You're crazy. That's not. Who who's ever heard of giving young rice? You know, wait until it's wait until it's done." Wait until the end of the harvest. Once we've harvested it and portioned it out, we'll set a portion aside and we'll give that portion as charity. And Godanya said, no way. I, I, I think we should do things right away. 
This is my intention is to give, be the first to give. Give the first part, you know, before you take for yourself in order to counter uh, avarice, greed, stinginess, miserliness. Give first, he said. And his brother said, give last. And then, this is, so this is what they did. Then, then Kondanya, the, the, one, the younger brother said, in that case, we split our field in half. You give me half the field, you, give, you take half the field, and I'll do what I want, you do what you want. And so they did. So they were both were quite generous and, and spiritual people, and they were both supportive of uh, religious people. But Subhadda gave first. Uh, uh, Kondanya gave first, and Subhadda gave last. And so, they say this is the reason why Kondanya was the first to understand the Buddha's teaching, but Subhadda. Subhadda came to see the Buddha when the Buddha was about to pass away. He was sick. He was resting, recovering from his illness. And Ananda forbid it, he said. The Blessed One is sick. The Blessed One is weak. He's, he's, he's resting. No chance. But the Buddha said no. The Buddha said, let Subhadda in. He understood that this was the time for Subhadda at the very end. And so Ananda let him in. Let him in, And this, this shows up in the Paridibbana Sutta. He, there's a different teaching. So I guess we can understand that he taught more than one thing, which is, that's okay. We'll just understand it that way. In, in, in this, com the Dhammapada, it is said that he taught this verse as well. These two verses. And that's that. Uh, apparently he asked questions and the Buddha answered these in response to his questions. So that's the, the story. Now the lesson, let's talk about lessons. Before I get into the actual verse, let's talk about lessons you can get from the, the story. Because I think there are two important things to just point out. It's an interesting story, but it does raise a couple of interesting points. The first is don't uh, don't wait. You know th there is fruit to doing things first. You can take that lesson from it. That most people would probably say Kundanya had the right of it because why would you wait? Why, if if this is the fruit, wouldn't it be great to be the first, or if not the first, early? Who wants to be the last and have to risk that, right? It shows the it shows the connection there that there is a potential connection if you procrastinate certainly that's a bad thing I think it's the idea is that Subhadda didn't procrastinate it was just his way and uh, as a result you really shouldn't ultimately say that one is better than the other but uh, you can take from what you will if you want early results uh, early do do things early certainly don't procrastinate. But uh, the other thing that you can point to from this is, is just that, that it's the way of different people. And so you can be, you should feel uh, reassured and, and encouraged that you've all come when you're not at the end of your life and I'm not at the end of my life. And uh, so we're in good shape to practice and I'm in good shape to help you practice. Um, but on the other hand, some pe sometimes there's a there can be a sense of discouragement that it might be too late, and uh, you, you, that you you maybe missed an opportunity, you know, the feeling that um, feeling discouraged when you see others who maybe become uh, proficient in the practice more quickly. You know, for some, practice is slow; for some, it is quick and there's not a sense that even one is better than the other because to some extent it's just our way. Some people will take many lives. <laughs> even uh, Mahamogalana took less time than Sariputta, the two Buddha's two chief disciples. And the one who is said to be the greater of the two took longer. Uh, so the the story of Subhadda and, and Kondanya gives us this idea or, or is an example of this idea of of every everything in their ti in its time, people have different paths, and uh, rather than comparing ourselves with conceit, thinking ourselves better or worse, feeling mm, 
feeling uh, disappointed in ourselves or discouraged by our difficulties in the practice. You know, understand that things come in their time. Don't push too hard. Sometimes we f try and force it and we get frustrated when results don't come the way we want. You can just think of, the, of Kundanya and Subhadha who got their results when they should. We don't know what our past karma is, so we try and work with what we have. So that's the story. Now the verse itself is, I guess, a little more profound and has some more profound lessons for us. It's a little, I think, difficult to understand the verse without making the connections. So there are some connections you have to make, especially with the first part. Now the first part of the verses, it repeats in, in the two verses, are the, the first part is repeated. But the first quarter of the verse says that there is no path in the air, which taken by itself seems like a crazy thing to say. I mean, it's not wrong, but it seems like a complete non sequitur. What does this have to do with the Buddha's teaching? Why are you teaching this? Um, so the way it should be understood, I think, is in, in, in conjunction with the second part. There's no path in the air is is actually another way of saying that there is no samana outside. A samana outside may sound strange as well, but it's, it's it's there's a simple explanation there. Outside is just a word that means outside of the Buddha's teaching. It's uh, the way they often just, especially in poetry, refer to the, the meaning of the word is uh, uh, apart from our religion. Um, Samana, the word samana is a word I leave untranslated just because I don't have a great word for it because I want you to understand that it's another fairly simple word. It just means um, a, a person who is spiritual. It's uh, where the word shaman comes from. And uh, so the Buddha used it in some cases just to refer to any religious person. But here is actually, of course, talking about something a lot deeper. So... The Buddha says uh, there is no enlightened person. When he talks about samana, he means there is no enlightened person outside. And this is what in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, the Buddha is said to have taught Subhadda. That, the, that Subhadda asked him whether other religions had enlightened beings. And the Buddha said there are no samana outside of the Buddha's teaching. He said in whatever sasana there is the eightfold noble path when you have right view right thought and so on then there is a there will be a sotapanna sakatagami anagami arahant there'll be enlightened beings but he said there i don't see any any religion outside of buddhism that has that and this is where the first part comes in because this is of course unsurprising but not very reassuring to people who are new to Buddhism unsurprising because well it's what every religion says right our religion is the best everybody else is wrong we're right you're everyone else is wrong then it's so it's not very reassuring because it sounds like a boast it sounds like a an unsupported claim it even can be disappointing to some people who want to find similarities in religions and to some extent, it's it's a bit muddied in modern times because, of course, hi what we call Hinduism was influenced by Buddhism, right? It's not Buddhism, but it was certainly influenced by it. And because Buddhism is many different things now, right? Um, there is even uh, secular movements that t uh, draw upon the Buddhist teaching. There is uh, psychotherapy. That, that doesn't claim to be religious often incorporates the sorts of practices that we do, right? So it, it's muddied by the fact that mindfulness is now a part of modern discourse, uh, you know, ordinary discourse. People talk about mindfulness not in the original sense of the word, but as a meditation practice, as a, a means of cultivating objectivity in, in a meditative sense. So, but at the time of the Buddha, and even in modern times, if we talk about the differences between religions. 
Buddhism was exceptional and is exceptional. And it relates to the first part, that there is no path in the sky. I think that's an, a, a very powerful imagery to talk about the second part, that um, just as there is no path in the sky, so too you're not going to find an enlightened being outside of the Buddha Sasana because they're just in the sky. It's just, it's not grounded, is what we would say in English. So there are some obvious examples of this, like the idea that the way to be free from suffering is belief in God, for example. Well, there's, that's like try, that's like saying, hey, look at that path in the sky, kind of, you know. There's nothing there. There's no connection. There's no evidence. There's no basis for that. And, and you can say it's not grounded in reality. So what is exceptional about Buddhism is the grounding in experience, right? Uh, even take samatha meditation or any tradition that talks about uh, absorption, like transcend transcendental paths, or Hind a lot of Hindu meditative paths that, that transcend the illusion of, of experience, for example. So because they are transcendental, they're dealing with a... Um, idea they're dealing with still often god but quite often dealing with uh, with a, a single object a thing that you focus on and they're not uh, at all connected with actual experience the things that lead to suffering so the idea is you escape it and and somehow uh, that is is a permanent freedom but it's not because it doesn't address it's not grounded in the issues of suffering and the cause of suffering. There's this um, there's this story of uh, an allegory, I guess, of of or a joke even of someone who is outside looking for something. And uh, someone comes and says, "What are you doing?" Oh, I lost. This. I lost my glasses, or I lost my contact lens, so they can't even see. And the person starts to help them and says, "Oh, you know, well, do you, where exactly did you lose it? Oh, I lost it inside. Well, then why are you looking out here for it? Oh, because the light is better out here. They they use this as uh, in science as as a uh, um, a term for looking in a place that is convenient. And and it relates here because God is convenient. Samatha meditation is convenient. It's comfortable. You're not challenged when you're dealing with concepts, when you have something you can cling to, even if it's just a color or a light, a fl candle flame, if someone focuses on that. You're not challenged in the way that you are challenged when you have to focus on your experiences, when you have to actually take pain as a meditation object. It seems absurd, horrifying that you should have to do that. Be present with your emotions. Don't 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 run away from them. You don't don't try and escape them. It's not something we're used to. We're used to fight or flight, fix or flee. You know, make it better or or find something better. So we, we, we look in all these different places, but it's like looking for a path in the sky. Looking for your contact lens in a place that you didn't lose it is like looking for a path in the sky, is like looking for enlightenment outside of actual experience. So we can say with, with quite um, complete certainty, or we can, we can, uh, we can appreciate even as newcomers, you can appreciate the difference. I mean, you see immediately the difference between focusing on reality, like the Buddha explained, and trying to find freedom in some magical conceptual experience. So that's the first two parts. The third part, the uh, third part of the first verse, uh, well, the third and fourth parts, they go together. 
is that people delight in papancha. And I didn't translate this one either. People delight in papancha, but Buddhas are free from papancha. Or tathagatas, those who are thus gone, those who have gone in this way, those who have traveled this path are free from papancha. And I, papancha is a word that gives me trouble. Uh, I know there's there's a movement to sort of translate it as uh, mental pl proliferation. But it, 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 I don't want to go into too much detail. I, th I think that's a great way to understand it. But papancha is um, translated sometimes as an obstacle or a, an obstruction, a hindrance. Uh, it's translated as this diffusion. And it's also translated as obsession. It appears to be um, getting entangled, getting caught up in something. It's not a good mind state. It's a state of entanglement, let's say. I mean, the, the mental pl proliferation, they translate it as. It's a, sort of a modern or a Western, maybe uh, a modern anyway, way of, d of translating it. What exactly it means, it, it definitely is a hindrance, so it's not a good thing. It seems to involve some crossing some line, so it's related to obsession. But people delight in it, so no one delights in hindrances. We delight in things that are hindrances. And papancha is what comes after thinking. So when you think about things, you fall into papancha, which m which makes means it makes sense to talk about it as this proliferation. It relates very much, I think, to the first part, how the Buddha's teaching is very grounded in reality. And what it's what makes uh, the practice of mindfulness, let's say, very different from even the practice of samatha meditation. So this is useful as a lesson for uh, people on a meditation course to get a sense of, of that distinction between objective observation of experience and this diffuse state of mind, the, the proliferation, which I think means that um, papancha, a good definition of it is making more out of things than they actually are. That's how I like to talk about it. I think it's um, an important part of the problem. And so I think it fits well with the idea of papancha. Making more out of things than they actually are. It's It, it covers so much, right? If you like something, um, you absolutely have made more out of the thing than it actually is. There's nothing intrinsically likable about experiences. Seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, thinking. They are what they are. Seeing is just seeing, hearing is just hearing. And it gives you an idea of why we practice mindfulness in the first place. Why are you repeating a mantra to yourself? It's because the word mindfulness, of course, the word sati, actually translates to something more like rem remembering. And what do we mean by that? By It means remembering um, what things are instead of forgetting that and getting lost in what we think they are. This this happy feeling is good. This painful feeling is bad. Good and bad, you've made more of it than it actually is. This feeling is me. This pain is mine. Yeah. T turning turning experiences into situations and situations into problems is making more out of things. So for this is this is a problem I think that has to be acknowledged with. Um, with uh, labeling mental illness as depression or or what they say schizophrenia, it's not that it's wrong, and it's not that it's not descriptive. It's just that it can become a reification. You you have created something more than what is actually there. 
And this is something we have to catch ourselves with as meditators, making a narrative that I am in this situation, this is happening to me, this problem has arisen, when the actual reality is just moments of experience. And if you're able to see those moments of experience, the, the, the problem disappears. It was never there. It was papancha. It was extra. It's not what's actually there. So this is the the a, a clear, I think, indication of, of the difference, whether you whether people believe agree with the Buddha or not. You can see there is this distinction that our 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 very clear goal is to see things as they are. Right when this very powerful teaching the Buddha gave to Bahia, what is the simplest teaching you can give? Dite dita matang bovisiti. Let seeing just be seeing. Hearing what is heard, let it just be what heard. No, nothing more. No more. No less. That's nipa pancha. And it's it's powerful. It, it's it's perfect. It's pure. And it, it's it creates clarity in the mind. You'll see that a big part of the process of the practice is um, realizing things about yourself that you didn't know, and and uh, being being forced to to confront uh, aspects of yourself that weren't really clear to you before. Getting a better sense of how your mind works, and of course, ultimately, then freeing yourself from bad habits, the parts, of the aspects of your mind that are causing you stress and suffering. So that's the first verse. The second verse starts the same. Just as there are no paths in the sky, there is no there is no there is no way to enlightenment outside of the observation of experience or the clear vision of experience as it is. But then the second part changes. There is no sankhara, no formation that is eternal. And, but the Buddhas never waver. So these two are in, in contrast as well. And this is, of course, another um, important core aspect of our practice, the impermanence of formations. So the Buddha gives a contrast um, that uh, you're looking for um, for permanence. That permanence doesn't exist in experiences. It doesn't exist in formations. It exists in enlightenment. It's a it's a very profound uh, sort of idea because of course permanence is something that, knowing or not, it's that we seek out, we seek it out in our uh, our lives, our ambitions, our goals. It's the highest goal in many religious traditions. This uh, permanent state, right? Heaven that might be permanent, communion with God, for example. The idea that no formation is permanent it, it is therefore an important um, you know, important rejoinder to free us from from following the wrong path. Of course, the most the most glaring is is following a, a a wrong religious path, thinking that if I follow this religious path, I'll find a, a permanent home for myself in heaven, for example, or as, a, or as God or something in, in certain religions. Uh, but it, of course, is, is much more practically important for, for, for ordinary life as well. A reminder that the things that we cling to are impermanent. Our families, our loved ones, our, our partners, our possessions, 
even our own bodies and that when we cling to these things the eventual loss is is what actually brings us stress and suffering um, you know the the impermanence of them is something we can never avoid for meditators of course it takes on a, an, another level the same idea but uh, another um, m order of magnitude because we see this um, constantly with anything that we try to cling to you might have a pleasant experience one moment and, and, and really be happy with that and kind of reassured by it complacent as a result of it and then struggle when it disappears so I, I think there are two lessons here that, I mean these are things you should already know we already know about the importance of seeing impermanence but the first is to not cling to uh, pleasant or unpleasant experiences so when we talk about papancha we're talking about the difference between concepts and ultimate reality but once you make that distinction this is, can be seen as the next step where your experiences don't don't to do not cling to them the good ones the bad ones uh, and and the second part to uh, be able to see the impermanence of of all experiences to to free you from any attachment sankara sasatanati there is no eternal formation it it is probably the most disconcerting uh, thing right because it's it's diametrically opposed to our ordinary inclination Try and find a refuge, find something you can depend on, some sort of stability. We come to meditation for that. So we try to organize our practice and, and, and organize our minds and focus our minds. If only I can get my mind to a state that is stable, lasting, so, so on. And, and this shift, when you realize that that's not even the goal, is disconcerting. It, it's like a growing up in a sense because you have to be accountable. You have to be flexible. It's kind of like um, a good description of being an adult, of being able to adapt rather than depend, being, being impervious to the changes of life. I, mean, I don't think it's a good description of most adults, but it, it is a kind of there's a distinction and you could say that someone who's still dependent of course is like a dependent infant but we 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 depend upon stability if things are like this that is acceptable and so an important idea is this idea of lack of dependence the anisito juviharati dwelling independent uh, that's, I think, the important teaching here, and and that that is true eternity. I mean, it, it, there's an unshakability. Nati buddhanam injitang. There's no injita. Injita is like this wavering or vacillating, which is in contrast to formations. You can't find peace in things. Your peace has to be independent of experiences and and things in general. So that I think is is the meaning of these verses. That is the teaching that the Buddha gave to Subhadra, one of his last teachings. And that's Dhammapada verses two five four and two five five. So thank you for listening.